librarian said I've been a librarian since 2013 at Moffitt. Um, but ironically, for somebody who deals with books a lot um, and recommends books to people, reads books all the time, I never really appreciated the effort that went into writing one until I, I did this. So um, this is going to be a little bit of like a, a perspective of, you know, from a book lover's perspective of, of writing their first book. And, and I'm going to give you uh, a, a plenty of pictures. Don't worry about that. Uh, although I do want you to buy the book, so I'm not going to give away too much of it, obviously. Um, but um, so uh, at any rate, um, I, this is our this is our village. Um, again, the town is there's a map of the town that's much bigger, but this is from uh, the Orange County Atlas of uh, 1903. And uh, just to kind of give you some perspective of where everything is, I'm going to have some parts of the map uh, throughout the presentation, so you kind of know where all the buildings are. But you know, as you know, this is our area. It's kind of defined by the Moodna Creek, which uh, flows into the Hudson River um, just to the south of us, as well as uh, Schoonamook Mountain, which is one of the largest uh, mountain ranges. Uh, uh, sorry, it's uh, the, the um, largest mountain peaks in, in Orange County. And uh, those two things kind of help define our area. And um, kind of when you're looking at history and you're looking at why did people settle in places, you look at the geography of that. And we'll get into that in a little bit um, as, as we go along. Uh, and the, as you know, this is our library. This is when we first opened in 2017. Those of you who were, you were here that day, um, really momentous occasion. Um, you get beautiful uh, adult wing, beautiful local history room. But as you know, it was never really like that all the time. Um, when I, when I first came on in 2013, um, uh, the local history part was kind of part of what I did, but it wasn't really everything. But one of the first jobs that I had when it came to dealing with the local history collection was going through the, um, the Moffat Library building and uh, doing an inventory of, of all the documents that were uh, stored in the vault uh, while the building was temporarily relocated um, to Campbell Hall. And, um, you know, coming across a lot of these items in a building that no longer had electricity, um, didn't really have functioning, you know, AC system, obviously, because there wasn't anybody in there at the time. Um, and going through some of these old photographs, it certainly had a, a really, it kind of had a, a King Tut's tomb feel about it, um, where you're discovering things that um, either maybe only a few people got to see in, in, uh, while they were actually there or were actually even published or shared. Um, it also kind of added to the, the kind of, not to, not to drag Halloween into everything, but um, you know, certainly had like that spooky uh, Scooby-Doo aspect to it. Um, and it was, it kind of really charged me as a, as a historian to kind of uncover some of these really interesting items. And, one of the things that we came across was a collection of glass plate negatives from the turn of the century, roughly taken between 1900 and 1910. And um, we were able to work with an outside vendor, Hudson Archival, um, who specialized in scanning these um, rare negative images. And we were able to get digital images made from them. And so with all these images, we decided, you know what, it's great, it, it's time to write a book. And I remember going into um, our director, Carol McCrossan's office and telling her about all this really great stuff is coming across. And she just turns to me and she goes, when are you gonna write a book? And I said, you know what, it's, it's about time. It's been several years now. Um, this was after we moved into the new building or the new old building, I should say. And um, I began, I contacted uh, Arcadia Publishing and they had a, uh, a whole process that you had to kind of follow. So. I had to sell the book. I had to sell the idea of the book and do put all these put all the research and the um, images together. Uh, so the first thing first things first is historiography um, and kind of doing just a survey of what was written about the village and the town um, before. Um, this is one of the the books that I kind of consulted along the way. It's a 1908 edition of Russell Headley's History of Orange County. Uh, weighing in at a whopping 997 pages, I wouldn't recommend it uh, to as a, as a beginner's <laughs> read to uh, a lot of people. Um, but it, it is a good example of not what was being written in the 19th century. Because what historiography is, is you're looking at what were people writing about in the past? 
about the past, right? It's kind of, it, you're, it, so it's a really kind of a deep dive into attitudes of the time period in which history was written, what they knew at the time, what they didn't know at the time. Um, Native Americans, indigenous people get mentioned briefly, but they don't really expand too much on them. And the people that they're talking about are mostly relatives of the people who subscribed to purchase these books. So you're going to see a lot of the same names popping up. And those are the people who are buying these books. Um, so you want to make them look, you want to make certain families stand out. Um, and Washingtonville and Blooming Grove gets a, a, a nice little chapter written about it um, by, um, a, by, by another uh, well-known, um, by Marcus, Dr. Marcus Sears, uh, who uh, is a very, fairly well-known person in the area at the time. But there was another book that was written earlier by Ruttenberg, um, and that was about 880, 829 pages, just the history of the county in general. So you could imagine sifting through this and, skip, and if somebody came up to my desk and said, I'm looking for a book on the history of the area. And I just kind of plop that in front of them. You can probably imagine the eyes glazing over and, and them kind of just saying, you know, <laughs> um, obviously the one that most people are very familiar with is E.J. McLaughlin III's Around the Watering Trough, um, A History of Washingtonville. Now, E.J. was a very interesting character. Um, again, I never knew E.J. personally, but um, I mean, I've, I've, I've read some of his articles. I've read this book more times than I could count backwards, forwards, upside, upside down, right side up. Um, the words seem kind of funky at that point, but, um, but EJ's book was interesting in that it was kind of the, it's the most recent history of the village um, and the, in the area. Um, but at the same time, it's re, it's, it was last, the only time it was published was once in 1994, 1993, 1994. So it's, really, really dated. It was coming up to being 30 years old at this point. A lot of things that he was referencing as new were no longer new and actually had changed completely. And as we've seen over the last couple of years, even most recently with the, um, the demolition of, uh, of, the, of the Brewster board home uh, for Orange County Bagels, history is changing all the time. Um, so, but at the same time, his book is very interesting in that he is, he is mentioning reflections of what it was like growing up in the area at the turn of the 20th century when he was a young child and, 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 and through most of the 20th century, as did the 19th century histories. A lot of those, like we don't think about it, but the, um, the people who were writing in the late 1800s about the village, they were only maybe a generation or two removed from the American Revolutionary War and people who grew up in the 1700s. So, uh, you, you know, you, you kind of take some things with a grain of salt and take something and, and you kind of try to analyze other things that maybe he might have gotten wrong. And I kind of tried to do that with this book a bit. I couldn't do, I couldn't write a history that was 800 pages long because I was limited to about 128 pages. Most of it was pictures. Um, and at the same time, I wanted to give people enough information to go by where if they did want to learn more, they could pick up EJ's book or they could pick up the other books that I've referenced and do, and as well as primary sources that are available through our library and do their own research. And that's kind of what we are here to, to kind of facilitate as librarians is other people's interests. Another book that, that came up was uh, Salisbury's History of Orange County. Um, this book is mostly pictures. Um, Tony Knipp actually helped with uh, compiling some of them. He's, he's mentioned at the beginning. And this was, this came out in 1993. Um, the problem with this book is that the captions are very brief. It's just one sentence or just like, here's a picture of a railroad station. Okay, great. But what does that tell you about the railroad station? Nothing. So, so this was, an, this is another book that's in our local history collection that, you know, people are saying, I'm just, I'm just looking for pictures or of, of, of the area. Um, this is one that, you know, we've, 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 we've tried it out in the past and they usually, most people are pretty satisfied with them, but it doesn't really give you anything. It doesn't really give you uh, a sense of, of, of history that you're learning something. So outlining the book chronologically or subject-based, I could certainly, you know, go th through time if I wanted to, if I had enough pictures, um, I could go by subject just on one thing. I decided to kind of do a mix 
um, because looking at the images that we had available, I could only use uh, a, up to maybe 200, 210. Um, and if they're from a diverse period, if they're from a, a large span of time and I could tell enough stories in each chapter with each of those pictures, great. If not, you know, I'm kind of, I'm kind of left up to my own devices. So I decided to go subject-based, uh, but also telling the history of a specific part of our past through that. So the chapter on schools, you see one room, you start with a one room school, you end with uh, Taft Elementary, uh, more modern school. Um, you're looking at the house chapter, which we're gonna get to soon. Um, you start with very basic, I built this myself house, all the way to modern prefab Sears and Roebuck style houses. Um, how do I tell the, how do I organize these images to tell a story? I couldn't tell the story of each building in its completeness, but I tried to do the best I could in each caption because each image could only have a caption of roughly 50 to 70 words. Um, so it, it kind of really, you have to really think of what information is, is the most important that tells you the most detail about what's going on. Um, and then if you have a picture, if you have multiple images of the same building throughout different time periods, as we'll see with the business chapter, um, you could actually go into a little bit more detail with that. So I tried to, I kind of tried to mix those two and throughout the chapter, you're going to see the same building pop up at different times. And then you're going to see what ends up happening to it. Um, and the major events to focus on, um, World War One, World War Two. Obviously, you know, again, more military centric, but also there was stuff that was going on that was related to women's rights movement, even even uh, the, 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 the kind of the, the you know, the African American community been. in our village and kind of That's how enough. that evolved. Um, so kind of going into detail with those things, too, and trying to tell a story with them. I was also inspired by um, Pokemon Go. It's an app. If you're not familiar with it. Um, you ask your kids, ask your grandkids. Um, it's basically an app where you could catch these imaginary creatures on your phone, but it's done in an altered reality setting, meaning that it looks as if they're appearing in real life on your phone. And what I try to do with a lot of the pictures um, in this book is if I had a picture of the outside of the building, I wanted people to feel like they were walking into it. And so following that up with, here's the exterior shot and the interior shot. Um, as you know, so trying to kind of replicate, um, being there in that time and place, uh, was really important for me because I wanted to really make people aware of what life was like back then, even in these buildings that no longer, that may no longer exist anymore. So cover image, that's another thing that I, I kind of learned what, which one, which one is best. There were two options. There was the uh, Samuel Moffat store. At this time, it was owned by uh, John C. Uh, uh, Warner um, at the intersection of 94 and 208 now. And then the other one was the firehouse. And, I, and, and the publisher said, the firehouse image is gonna sell more books, but it's completely up to you. And I, had, I weighed both options. So the firehouse one is really appealing. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people who are in the fire department would pick up a copy of the book. The other one is a, is a storefront. But in the end, I went with the storefront because if you look closely at this picture, you see there's not, as opposed to, and don't worry, the fire department, they, that picture does end up in the book too. I don't worry, I made sure of that. But that image is of a specific group of people. They're important people, but they're part of a certain group of people. Um, I wanted this book to really represent everybody or be as inclusive as possible. So when you look closely at the store image, you see there's, there's young people, there's older people, some are working class, others might be a little bit better off. So regardless, I wanted you to pick up this book and say, see yourself and one of these people that's standing there um, in, in the best possible way. And it's also, it, it, it's, it is a landmark. It was a landmark that is no longer there. Um, sadly. So it's a kind of a reminder of this is this building that was the center point of the town or the village, I should say, since the early 19th century. It's no longer there anymore, but
but it's something that people remember still because it was in existence well into the 1960s. So that to me, I found very important and critical to, to uh, pick as the picture. So the first chapter is historic houses. And um, I'm going to give you a kind of a whirlwind tour of the book. Um, so one of the houses that I, I start off with is the Samuel Moffat the third home. This is the home as it would have looked at the corner of uh, Goshen Avenue and Blooming Grove Turnpike. Um, you notice that there's a building that is there now, and that's the Moffat Library. So this is one of the earliest pictures of this building right before um, it was purchased by the uh, Library Association and moved across the street and flipped 180 degrees. And now that's, um, that's Jay Cuts. So, um, and before that it was Flowers by Joan. And again, to show you how fast history changes, um, when I wrote this book, it was Flowers by Joan and now it's, it's Jay Cuts. So, um, you know, but the building is still there. And uh, if you don't, if you're not familiar with them, Samuel Moffat III um, was, uh, you know, part of the Moffat clan that moved into the area in the 1730s. Um, according to E.J. McLaughlin, the attic was used as a meeting place for Washingtonville Lodge 220, free and accepted masons in 1813. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty large building, but it's pretty, it's also standard for the federal period. Uh, it, which is kind of constitutes that's what this the style of architecture is. We also have the Sarah Jakes McLaughlin House. It's also known as the Dr. McMillan Home. Um, again, and and uh, Sarah Jakes and, and here we, here it appears um, on the um, on the 1903 Atlas of Orange County, and she was the uh, so she 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 was the um, the daughter of John Jakes, and uh, and she uh, so it's a it's a it's, and I'm sorry so it's it's a pretty it's a pretty standard home for uh, somebody who's very well off um, and uh, the portico though was removed so if you look if you drive past the house today it's, just, it's that big white house the shutters are still there the windows are still there but the gables and the portico are no longer there uh, which is pretty sad, but if you're thinking about, you know, what your stereotypical Victorian or, you know, uh, 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 Queen Anne style home is, that's what this house is. And it's meant to kind of exude the sense of wealth about it. Um, another home that's like that is the Elizabeth Halleck home. Uh, that's also still standing. Um, she was the sister of William H. Halleck. Uh, his home also still stands in Washingtonville. And this home was designed by New York City architect E.G.W. Dietrich. Um, and he designed several homes in, in the colonial revival and craftsman style. So this is more of a craftsman style home. Um, it was also owned by the, um, the owner of Schuler uh, Beer Company as well. So this is, also, this is now um, an office uh, building. Uh, then we finally get to the Overfield home. And the, the neat thing with the Overfield home is, again, this is also another house that's still standing. And this photograph was taken around 1928. And uh, the home is considered a Langston or a Gladston model home. And the reason why I say that is because this was how these houses were classified in the Sears and Roebuck catalog. So by the 1920s, people had, uh, you had a rising middle class that could afford, uh, you know, fairly standard homes. And you could order a house through Sears and Roebuck and they would deliver it to you. And they, you, they would have to assemble it, but it was a standard cookie cutter style. So this is an example of that. Um, so again, we kind of, in this chapter, we go from building something yourself to I, I've, I have all this money, I wanna show it off to um, I, I need something practical. Um, I'm not a, a vintner's daughter or um, a dairy merchant, um, you know, but I, I do plan to make this home, uh, this place my home. And you'll see a couple of these houses actually are, are in Washingtonville. If you see this image, you've been, as soon as you start pet driving, driving through the area, you'll see more of these houses as they pop up. So the next chapter is businesses. And again, like I mentioned before, the Moffat Trading Post is kind of an iconic uh, building. It was um, at this time, uh, this, this picture shows George A. Owen uh, with James Villiers on the left and William V. Davey on the right. Um, Owen took over the store from John C. Warner in 1891. 
Um, so this is after that cover picture was taken. Um, then from 1891 to 1915, the store was owned by George A. Owen. Um, and then his son Wilbur Owen took over in 1915 and ran it into uh, ran it until 1938, and then it was sold to the Grand Union, um, you know, the the supermarket chain. Uh, then, um, so right here is where it sat next to the Moffat Library, and then if we go inside, uh, here's George A. Owen uh, looking, you know, very proud of himself. Um, the uh, if you look on the left-hand side, there's actually some postcards there. Those postcards are now on our digital collections page on New York Heritage. Um, so if you go there, you can see a few of those postcards there. And actually, some of them make it into the book as well, which is pretty cool. Um, so you're kind of looking at his merch. Um, to the right is a display cabinet. And if that looks familiar, that's because that cabinet is at the entryway of the Moffat Library today. There's a Nerf gun in there, and there's a few historic photographs kind of showing uh, local scenes and some of the library programs past and present, um, which is pretty cool. So even though the building no longer stands, some of the remnants still remain. And we actually do have the, uh, the, the Warner sign um, in our vault as well. Another building that makes it into the book is the Cornell Nunny Meat Market um, that's right on Goshen Avenue. Um, the, it's, it's right next to the bank, the former place of the Bank of Washingtonville. And you can see on the, on the rafters there, those are, those are actual chickens and turkeys that are being um, seasoned. Um, and uh, there would usually be a smokehouse in the back that where the meat would be seasoned for, for maybe a week or two. And, um, and then eventually they would be sold uh, as is. Um, you could also see that there's some garlands and stars hanging out. So this was probably taken, this photo was taken probably around the, the holiday season. That building still standing today. You might know it as F&J Pizza. I know it as my first apartment. The uh, interior of, uh, of Mike's Meat Market provided a good opportunity for me to kind of show what a, what a turn of the century, early 20th century butcher shop would have looked like. Uh, so this is, um, this would have been across the street. Um, basically in the year where, or in the same, uh, um, same place as where Simply Computers uh, was. And uh, so we see here um, uh, Michael Gatley uh, right at the cutting board there. Um, sawdust is on the floor, um, and that's to collect blood that's being uh, spilled from the cutting of meat. And you can see right to the right is the cash register. So you basically walk right into the store and the guy's doing his work for right in front of you. And it, to me, it doesn't get more, I guess in my modern sensibilities, more disgusting and, <laughs> and unhealthy as that, but it's, it kind of shows you kind of what people, how people would have lived back then. And I thought that was kind of a neat way to show, uh, show that. Um, the first National Bank of Washingtonville, uh, this is a pretty cool shot. I actually got asked the question by somebody who's related to some, uh, the former I believe they were the, the, the chairman of, of this bank when it was first established. And um, in, the, in 1880, um, Edward R. Emerson, who was the president at the time of the Brotherhood Wine Company, um, pushed for, along with other local business leaders, they pushed for a bank because before that, uh, what they would do is they would actually give their checks to um, a local jeweler. He would then take the checks by train uh, to Newburgh and cash them. And he was kind of a trustworthy person and he would do all the banking for everybody once a week. Um, and that became unreliable. So then um, they founded in 1908, uh, the uh, first national bank of Washingtonville in this brick building. And this brick building now is um, uh, the uh, gu guilty pleasures, the cheesecake and the dessert um, bakery. Um, as well as uh, Alex's or the, uh, as, as well as a barbershop on the other side. Um, and if you look uh, the corners, the, 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 the plaque is still there um, from when that building was first built. It eventually outgrows its original location and they move across, the, they build a new building across the street, um, which is that stone building with, uh, which Chase Bank used to be in. Um, and that was in 1914. Um, Another, I couldn't really do a, a, a business chapter without Brotherhood Winery. Um, 
again, a very well-established business founded in 1839, one of the oldest, probably the oldest continuously operated winery in the United States. Um, this is an image from around 1900 of the uh, wine house or the storehouse there. Um, Jake's, uh, Jake's began, uh, it was started by John Jake's. He began experimenting with growing grapes behind his store at the corner of North and East Main Streets, which is now uh, where Stewart's is. Um, in 1824. And then from 1894 to 1921, when this picture was taken, the winery was owned by Edward R. Emerson, um, and he took it over from his father, Jesse Emerson. Um, he was responsible for, for expanding the winery's uh, operations and uh, produced um, and, 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 and production. So this, this wine house actually stored uh, wines from the Finger Lakes region, uh, rums, whiskeys, and champagne. Um, so it's a pretty important building. And you can see how much space they had uh, in this, uh, in the turn of the century atlas there. That's basically uh, where, where, well, part of that and where Emily Beaumont's property is, that's now uh, basically where um, stop, stop and Shop is. So moving on to schools. Um, again, you're gonna see kind of the progression of, of how things change in this chapter. So this is Lincoln Dale School. This is one of the glass plate uh, images. Um, this is located northwest of Washingtonville. School district number two served the towns of Hamptonburg, Blooming Grove. Um, similar schools would be heated in the winter with a wood burning stove, large windows, as you can see there, provided uh, ventilation in the warmer months, as well as natural light for reading and study. Um, the first school to be established in the area was in 18, 1809. It was a private school known as the Long House. Um, Jane Sweezy was that was the teacher there, and she was responsible for teaching all the children in what was known as Little York, which basically was a hamlet of nine homes. Um, so again, this is pretty typical of a house of a, of a schoolhouse during that time period. Um, in uh, the, now Wash now Washingtonville School District number uh, five uh, number five. Um, Started as um, a, um, started in another building on um, on Maple Street. That building is still standing. It's a private home now. I wouldn't recommend knocking on the door and asking, "Hey, can I take a look at your old schoolhouse?" But that building is still there. Um, this is the exterior of, of Number Five, um, and when the, this school was built in 1891, and the, this replaced that other school. Um, it served it served the children of the village of Washingtonville. Uh, prior to the introduction of indoor plumbing, students would use an outdoor privy, um, and uh, the ground floor contained classrooms for first through sixth grades and a small auditorium. Um, the second floor housed seventh and eighth grades, and, and as well as the high school classrooms, and one acre in front of the school was dedicated to outdoor activities such as baseball and, rudimentary, uh, and a rudimentary playground um, for, you know, swinging hopscotch, um, volleyball. The, uh, so you could imagine this, so imagine a elementary through high school in one building. Um, I, you know, I, my, I, I did not have the best high school experience or middle school experience, I should say, so I, I can't, I can't imagine what these kids went through, but um, it, it must have been cramped. Um, and this is also, if, to put things in perspective, this is during the time when the library was actually being used to hold graduation ceremonies because they couldn't fit everybody in the school, like parents and teachers and things like that. So um, all of the uh, convocation ceremonies, all of the big school plays were held at the library because even this school, which was pretty large for its time, could not fit all these people in it. And this is just shows you the interior of the school taken around 1915. You'll note that there's actually uh, a, uh, a calendar uh, on the wall there from Halleck and Nickel, which was a local business. It also gets featured in the book as well. Um, so it's a nice little Easter egg there as well. Um, all of these, all the desks were, you know, bolted to the floor. They're traditional, the made out of iron and wood. Um, they, uh, they had a compartment for textbooks and ink wells. Um, and they were filled every morning by the school janitor before classes commenced. So that was another job that the janitor had in addition to making sure the grounds were clear and things like that. One of the cooler images I came across uh, that I decided to put in this chapter was the surveying of what would be the uh, Washingtonville Central School uh, that would be built. 
1933. This is a picture from Russell Halleck Jr.'s collection, um, and I'm grateful for Russell for, for letting me uh, use it for the book. And this is, I believe, this is his father um, looking at a survey being done on the school and actually had it written on the back. Uh, there, was a, there, was a, there was a caption that said, surveying for the new school. Um, and that turned out to be this building here, uh, the Washingtonville Central School. Um, this was, Washingtonville was the, um, was the second school in Orange County to centralize, meaning that um, instead of having these kids being taught at all these various little one-room schools, you bring them into one school. And the infrastructure involved in putting this together uh, really kind of makes you appreciate the school system, the centralized public school system as it, as it was and is, because, the, because now that you have one school that's servicing all of these people from across the town, um, you need to have school buses, you need to hire school bus drivers, you need to improve roads. So all of that kind of gets, that kind of it gets lumped into this big project here. Um, it's a standard colonial revival um, uh, structure. It was made of Goshen brick um, and by the James Forrest and was constructed by the James Forrestall Company. It came in at a whopping um, $256,000 uh, for that time. And uh, to put that in perspective, the bond that was put on the, the, that specific school was not paid out um, until the 1960s, um, uh, which, is, which is pretty interesting in and of itself. Uh, Arlen Taft, who was the uh, principal of the previous school, um, ended up becoming the principal of this school as well. And this is what the uh, school district number five looked like. Um, just before it was demolished. It was eventually purchased by the uh, Washingtonville Cemetery um, Association. And that is now a uh, green space uh, where the cemetery is now. Uh, it was pulled by, a lot, it was demolished by a lock and tackle. So basically they, they took apart some of the major supports and then they had tied ropes to, uh, ropes to either end and they basically had uh, uh, trucks and people give, give it the old heave ho and just, pull it down. And there's pictures of that happening in the book as well. Uh, houses of worship. So uh, the first, the oldest permanent house of worship was constructed in 1823 um, on Old Dominion Road um, near New York State 94. Uh, today it's known as the Bloom and Grove United Church of Christ. And it remains one of the oldest still active churches in the community. Um, it's very unique in that it doesn't have a bell tower. Um, it also was constructed in an interesting way. Um, there's actually uh, no posts and beams. Well, there's, there's, there are, uh, they're, they're called king and queen posts that are in the structure. And it kind of, as opposed to having posts down the middle of it, uh, they're, they're off to the side. So it has like this very open air effect. And if you've never been inside this church, I highly recommend it. It's on the National Register of Historic Places as well. Another church is the First Presbyterian Church, and that's located on Goshen Avenue. Uh, this picture was taken in around 1920. Um, it was built in 1847 by James White and carpenter uh, John McCraig. Uh, the timbers from the farm of David H. Moffat and John Nicole were, uh, were used uh, for the original bell tower, uh, which later cracked. Uh, this photograph uh, shows it as it would have looked around 1920. Um, another church uh, that's very well known in the area is St. Mary's Roman Catholic Church. Um, the, uh, this is what it would have looked like around 1907 on the right-hand side, the, 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 the pastor is on the left-hand side. Um, that building on the left is still standing. The, uh, St. Mary's was, um, moved and remodeled several times before eventually it was, um, demolished to make way for the, the, the present church. Um, the, uh, so the, this is what it would have looked like on East Main Street around 1906. Um, and eventually it would have, uh, it, it would be expanded um, under, under direction of uh, Father John Tet uh, Tetro, who uh, was Canadian by birth. He came over here and he, uh, he found that he kind of helped expand the ministry. Now you also might be wondering at this point why I'm showing a picture of a dairy, uh, of, 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 a, of a creamery. And that's because that this is the, uh, this is this is the site of Bethany Presbyterian Church after it was moved from uh, Nelson Green's blacksmith shop on um, Depot Street. And uh, Bethany uh, was founded in uh, 1907. 
uh, I'm sorry, 19, um, 1901. And um, it is a historically uh, black congregation, uh, Presbyterian church, and it was very active in, in, our, in our area up until um, 2018, unfortunately, uh, due to low attendance. Um, but it, uh, what the, uh, the, so in 1950, but in 1955, the parishioners came together and they expressed a need for a larger church. Um, so they, uh, began meeting at Linden, uh, at Linden Manor Creamery, uh, and it was converted into a church. And one of the interesting stories I came across in researching this book was, um, Shirley Mann, who's a very lovely person. I highly recommend if you're interested in learning about the history of the, of the black community, of the African-American community in our area, she is a real wealth of knowledge. She actually took me to the church, um, a couple of years before they closed. And she said, I want, I want to show you something. So she takes me into the, um, into the rector's office. And she says, have you ever seen a rector's office with this before? And she pulls up in the carpet and there's a trap door and she opens it. And uh, that's where you actually put ice for the, uh, to store, the, to keep the milk and cream cold. So a lot of the original part of the building was still there. Moving on to transportation. This is a picture of the Blooming Grove Turnpike heading, uh, facing west towards Chester. You can see the Blooming Grove Church um, all the way in the back on the right-hand side. And, 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 and coming towards us is a gentleman on a hay wagon. He's actually standing on top of a mound of hay being pulled by two horses. So uh, again, you can imagine uh, the way life was back then uh, before automobiles and trucks really kind of came into being just by looking at this picture. And this probably would have been the same type of road that people would have come in on when the, when the, when the, the turnpike was first constructed in 1801. Um, and, and again, it, it, it kind of gives you an appreciation for a lot of the traffic that comes through here, um, uh, around rush hour, um, as well, because this is a main artery. Uh, some of the first trails in the area were, uh, were, were actually Native American paths. Um, and then later on, uh, the King's Highway was constructed. And then eventually the Turnpike was constructed which was a little bit more sturdier than the King's Highway. There were actual like clapboards and um, amount of dirt poured on top. So it was easier for, for wagons to travel. And this was kind of the main thoroughfare to get goods from um, the Black Dirt region to the ports in Newburgh and then out to New York City or you know further points uh, south into New Jersey. Uh, Brooks Bridge is another really uh, iconic transportation landmark no longer standing. There is a blue marker where it is, where it was, and this is Brooks Bridge as it would have looked heading into town. Um, and it was constructed in 18, uh, 18 uh, excuse me a second, notes here. It was constructed in 1840, um, and uh, it spanned the Moonda Creek along the western portion of the Blooming Grove and Grape Court Turnpike. Um, it was named after local farmer John Irving Brooks or John I. Brooks. Um, and he owned a farm off of Tolman Road in New Windsor and a home in Washingtonville. So he's a pretty, I would say, a pretty important dude um, in, in modern slang terms. Um, what I liked about this picture was that there's a little girl on the bicycle there, but you also see on the left and right hand side, there's advertisements for horse races and a lot of other local happenings. So it wasn't just a bridge, it was also kind of a way to promote things or it was kind of a place where people learned the news and what was going on. This is a picture of the Washingtonville Depot as it would have looked in 1970. The depot itself, I'm actually, a uh, spoiler alert, I'm, I'm, if you follow uh, the local history blog um, that I post usually every Thursday, um, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about the depot tomorrow. Um, but the uh, original Erie Depot, um, as this is what it would have looked on um, South Street in Washingtonville. It was part of the Newburgh branch of the Erie Railroad and it funneled passengers and goods from New York City to Buffalo and New York. Um, the uh, station burnt down, the original station burnt down in 1879, but it was replaced by this new station um, in the early, in, in, in the late 18, early 1900s, which was in use until the 1970s, uh, 1960s, 1970s. Um, passenger service was terminated in 1935, but the uh, Newburgh, but the Erie, uh, Erie Railroad's Newburgh branch eventually became Penn Central, and you can see Penn Central on the, the caboose there. Um, continued to haul freight until 1972. So you, looking at the caboose, looking at some of the, the, the rolling stock in the image here, you could tell that this, was, this, this image was taken during the, the last part of its life. Um, 
it uh, eventually became a, a antique store, but then when time came for it to be landmarked, there was a big push for it. It became the victim of an arson fire, uh, which was very tragic because we lost that a really important piece of our, our, our heritage that way. This is William Ted Hallett. It's probably one of my favorite pictures in the book because this guy, he owns a plane and he really shows it. Um, he's wearing his best suit. Um, he was a very well-known person in our area. He was the first Washingtonville resident to own a plane. He was a veteran of both world wars. He taught flying classes and he barnstormed um, in uh, his Curtis Jenny biplane, uh, which is the, 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 the model that you see behind you. Um, he also experimented with aerial photography. Um, so this is one of his images here. Uh, this was taken in October 1927. Uh, we were able to uh, get several of these from Russell Halleck Jr. Um, and it really kind of gives you a bird's eye view of the area as it would have looked in the 1920s, which is really, I, I thought this was so great. You go from, here's Ted in his plane. Okay, great. So what? Well, now you're in the plane with Ted and you're flying over Washingtonville and you could kind of see the Moona Creek just to the south of us. You see the school still standing where the cemetery is. You see uh, the, the church and you see the library off to the left hand, uh, the far left hand side uh, as well. So I always thought that was a really, really cool shot. The uh, Jenny was a pretty important plane. It was introduced by the Curtis Company in 1915. It was a training aircraft for the US Army and Navy. And uh, following the First World War, uh, surplus were sold uh, on civilian market. So uh, he was able to afford one and uh, do all this really, really great stuff that nobody else really could, could do at the time. So the next chapter I want to talk, uh, I, I really kind of wanted to discuss was weather and climate. And you really can't talk about the history of Washingtonville without talking about the effects of weather and flooding. Um, it's part of our history. It's kind of why people settled here in the first place when you think about it. A Native American settled in the area um, and because of its because of the fact that it did flood so much and the flooding caused the, uh, the soil to become very rich and great for agriculture. Of course, it kind of became the bane of, of, of the existence of the area. Um, and so this is an image of, from 1903 showing the ER Shones or Apple Storage build, Building, which is in the middle there um, on South Street following the October 1903 flood. During that time, uh, during that flood specifically, over 13 inches of rain fell in over two days and uh, the moon overflowed. Uh, they caused a landslide nearly 150 feet deep at Moona and mud on uh, and, and, and mud flowed, uh, floats, flooded several homes. Uh, 250 feet of rail track belonging to the Ontario and Western Railway was also damaged. So it was really hard. It, it became a problem if, uh, for, for railroads and transport as well. This is now the uh, Corner Candle Store. So this building has a long history. You see it here again in this image from 1955. Some of you who grew up in the area in the 40s and the 50s might remember Hurricane Diane and Connie. They were two back-to-back -back storms in August of 1955. Um, they, uh, many people uh, said that during that time, uh, they could remember the 1903 flood, and it was very similar to that at the, in the 1950s. Um, during this time, too, Ruth Overfield writes in her diary that I think her basement had between 8 to 10 inches of water in it. Um, so it kind of gives you an idea of, of how bad things were. But it wasn't all bad. Uh, these are two children skating on the Moodna Creek. Um, E.J. McLaughlin III, who grew up in Washingtonville at the turn of the 20th century, a little bit before this photo was taken, um, noted that when it was frozen over, the Moodna provided a good mile of ice skating and many impromptu hockey games. Uh, one favorite pastime included um, sledding on, from South Street Hill to the banks of the frozen creek, with the winner being the one who stopped closest to the creek. I wouldn't recommend that today for obvious reasons, but it kind of shows you how people were able to kind of make their own fun um, during these during adverse weather conditions. Another, uh, another iconic winter activity was downhill skiing. This is a photo taken from the top of Norseman Hill um, around the 1920s. And uh, Norseman Hill was home of the Norseman Hill Ski Club. They hosted annual tournaments and meets every winter, usually around February. And um, it was known for um, being a place where a lot of uh, Olympic athletes trained. 
Um, some, the dumps were discontinued sometime in the 1950s. Um, the area is now part of Schoonamon State Park. In some cases, you could still see parts of the ski jump today, but you have to kind of traverse some trails to get there, but it still is, it's, some parts of it are still there. So we showed a lot of Washingtonville. What about the rest of the area? A lot of people don't think that there is, uh, there is not much more to Bloom and Grove than Washingtonville, but there are hamlets that make up this area. And um, so I kind of wanted to highlight some of those things. So um, this is the, for instance, this uh, clubhouse uh, from the Bowman Beach Club um, was, uh, is located in Tomahawk Lake. Um, so if you live in that area, this, this might be a familiar building. Um, this is, just shows it as it would have looked in 1949. The community received its name from a man-made uh, lake created from the damming of the Cromline Creek in 1929, and development began in the 1940s after the Bowman Corporation purchased the adjacent farm properties. Another important hamlet is Craigville. Um, there's, it's really just a road now. A lot of people don't really know where Craigville is, but uh, this shows the uh, Craigville Church, uh, Methodist Episcopal Church. It was constructed in 1850. Um, and uh, the, the meetings were so popular here actually that uh, attendance would spill out of the church into the shade of the nearby trees. Um, by 1920, the church was used only occasionally. The building currently serves as the location of the Craigville Bible Church. So you can still see this building today. Uh, the Cromline Creek is one of two sources of the Munda Creek and it was named after the early settler, Daniel Cromline, uh, who immigrated from France with his wife, Anne Testart in the early 18th century. And uh, Craigville uh, kind of became uh, almost like a manufacturing hub. Uh, paper was produced there. Um, they had a lot of milling operations there. And unfortunately, because of the way the railroad ran, it kind of bypassed Craigville and, and eventually the, 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 to you know, uh, go uh, for, for uh, Gray Court and Chester eventually. So that area kind of, I don't wanna say like the Hamill kind of died and dissipated um, because of that. Um, another important manufacturing hub was Salisbury Mills. This is a picture of the Holden Paper Company plant. Um, and it was built originally in 1840 by Isaac K. Oakley. It was known as, uh, as the Arlington Paper Mill. And it used the Munda Creek to power equipment um, as, uh, to, to, uh, that would create a high quality paper. This paper was sold as far away as Britain and Australia as well. It was a company town. Uh, they actually built uh, factory housing for their employees. Um, today, it's the site of a hydroelectric plant. So I don't recommend going there either, um, but it just shows you kind of the long lasting nature of why people settled here, why the area developed. It's really the Moodna Creek that's doing a lot of the, the working here, uh, is, is, is kind of propelling people here initially. But then eventually we start to see in um, the, the early 1900s and 1920s, as a result of the railroad coming through, it's bringing people up from New York City. It's, uh, these people are saying, hey, this is a really great place to vacation. And you have establishments such as uh, Mountain Lodge Park being built. And there's actually a, a map in the book of Mountain Lodge Park um, when it was kind of in the transition phase of people vacationing here, be, uh, people going from vacationers to permanent residents, um, which is really interesting as well. It's a more modern piece of history as well. Uh, finally, we get to community. And I was trying to think of, you know, like, well, okay, when I, when I first was putting together the book, I had to look at what makes up a community. And it's public buildings, it's churches, it's schools, it's libraries, houses. So I went through all of those and I said, well, community itself, what is it? It's people. It's people doing things. It's organizations. It's people actually making a difference. Um, and so that, I kind of wanted to make this kind of that chapter. Um, this is a picture of uh, a postcard, I should say, of Main Street from around 1917, 1916, 1917. And um, the interesting thing with this postcard was, you see there's a banner across the middle there. And that's actually a banner that's uh, pushing for people to vote for women's suffrage in New York State. Um, and, uh, and it was put up by a local women's suffrage club and um, it was run by um, Miss Helen uh, Tuttle and, uh, and, and Mrs. W.M. Leonard, uh, Miss Siebel, Miss uh, 
Miss McLaughlin and uh, Miss Glover, Miss Loomis, um, and Miss McHenry. And uh, believe it or not, the amendment did pass November 6, 1917. There was a big centennial celebrate commemoration of that a couple of years ago. And uh, so this was a this is a pretty iconic, an important image in our local as well as state and national history as well. Uh, of course, I have to include the Moffat Library. Uh, this is uh, one of my favorite pictures, but not for the reasons that I don't think a lot of people might think. Um, this shows a, uh, a group of uh, members, I should say, of the Washingtonville uh, Fire Department Band. Unfortunately, the back of the photo only listed a few of them. And that was one of the tough things I came across when working with uh, my copy editor was her saying, can you identify any of these people? Like, like, where are these people? I said, this is, this is what I have. Literally, I have some scribbles and I, I said, here are the names that we have, but I can't tell you who is who. Um, so we tried to put as many of those people in, in, in there as possible. But um, the library itself was built in 1887 uh, with funds from uh, David H. Moffat Jr., who's a railroad tycoon, made, grew up here, but made most of his money out west um, in, in Colorado. Um, and the library, for most of its history, was a community center. It was, it was a place where the Women's Suffrage Club met, the DAR met, uh, the Grand Army of the Republic met. Um, the Athenia Club met. So all the clubs that I actually mentioned in this chapter, a lot of them met in this library for most of its early life. Um, Moffat Hall was where, like I said before, kids graduated. What I liked about this picture, though, is if you look to the left, there's a kid doing something that we usually tell kids not to do today, which is get off the building. Uh, there's He's actually photobombing uh, the, the, the shot there. So I wanted to show in this picture, at least, here's the seriousness of this building and of these people that came together to, to form this band. But then also here's somebody else who decided to get in on the action as well and have a bit of fun. Here's the inside of the Moffat, uh, Moffat Hall um, during the, in the 1940s and 1950s. The library, unfortunately, came upon hard times. They ended up having to use it as a rental hall. Um, for uh, weddings and concerts and things like that. And eventually, you know, it, was, it became a town hall, it was purchased by the town and the village. Um, this shows uh, the, uh, a, a woman, uh, a bride throwing a bouquet uh, off of the proscenium in what is now the Moffat Library's adult wing. Uh, where my desk is, is where all the folding chairs are to give you some perspective, um, but kind of shows the many uses of the building over years. Of course, here's the Monell Engine House. Um, again, named after Ambrose Monell, who contributed a lot of the funds to its construction um, with one of their new uh, ho um, motorized hose pumps uh, when, the, uh, when the Washingtonville Fire Company was first founded in the late 19th century. Um, it was basically just a hand cart that you would pump, kind of like a giant super soaker, and that would be used to kind of extinguish fires. Unfortunately, there was a major fire uh, in, um, in 1887. That, uh, that turned out like it, it was just insufficient for that. So by 1912, um, they were able to purchase a La France a fire truck, which you see in this picture here. Um, this building today is the, uh, is the police station. We all, speaking of the police, here's Chief Russell Halleck, uh, the father of Russell Halleck Jr. He's very well known, very well, well loved figure in this community. Um, where the uh, where his police box originally stood, um, not at the corner of 94 and 208, but actually closer to the entrance of Goshen Avenue, a little bit more dangerous uh, back around 1940. Um, he would answer distress calls and directed traffic from his from this booth, um, and uh, he also was a member of the Monell Engine Company for 71 years and caretaker of the Washingtonville Water Works for 44 years. Um, one of the things that I show in the in this part is you actually see here's here's his here's the police box with him in it, and then uh, and then you end up seeing what happens to it because a lot of other people don't realize that the the police box did uh, from roughly nineteen uh, nineteen sixty roughly nineteen seventies nineteen sixties nineteen seventies um, it was it was purchased by Russell's son because the town was trying to redo the roads. Um, Russell Halleck Jr. outbid everybody and per was able to purchase his father's uh, police box. They moved it 
from its location to Russell to Russell's property, and eventually was brought back um, in, in in the 1990s. Um, when it was restored recently, I was able to get a uh, kind of a, a look in of it, and you could actually see some of the phone numbers that Russell would have to call if there was an emergency or or a, or a relay line. So um, it kind of shows you kind of how rudimentary things were and what he had to deal with as being the first full-time police chief in the village. I don't want to leave out people who just moved here either. Um, again, so, and, and, and Washingtonville, as I said before, is a victim of its own success. The store was built at the intersection because of the amount of produce and goods that were being created in the surrounding area. They were being sold there. That attracted people to move here. Um, in the night, when the, the railroad kind of accelerates that, by the 1960s, you have the New York State Thruway and the car culture bringing people up and south uh, to Washingtonville and, this, and, and the baby boom, of course. So that expands the amount of people that are living here. Um, the, and as a result of that, you have the selling off of land such as uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Brooks, Brooks properties, um, you know, all, all these old dairy farms here uh, for condominiums. Uh, so this is an image taken by uh, Ruth Overfield um, from her home at, uh, at, at, uh, at the intersection of, um, at the corner of Arrow Point uh, Lane. And this is showing the weather vane condominiums being built around 1973. Um, so again, just as Ruth's father, um, purchased that Sears and Roebuck home in the 1920s because it was affordable. People were purchasing these condos because it was an affordable place. Uh, it, was, it was an affordable place to raise a family. And um, these people uh, who moved during this time period end up changing the community once more and continue to change it because this is the community that we now all live in. Um, and, 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 and as we see, it continues to grow and evolve to fit the needs of people. Um, one point I like to always bring up is that the fields that once uh, were uh, once once kind of helped with the establishment of the dairy industry in the area and of farming in the area and its success there began uh, by this point to cultivate something new. It began to cultivate people and community and changed over time. So uh, with that, I am going to uh, close the close the close the book on this uh, chat. Close the chapter on uh, on this talk, and um, I want to thank you all for letting me kind of highlight some of the things uh, in the book and my thought process as I was going through with it. Um, so, if you're interested, um, there's my contact information. I, I always say it's better to kind of email me if you have a specific question, because in that way I could kind of you could include a lot more details in that email than I could maybe be able to remember over the phone. And I could always get back to you. I'm very good with returning emails and, uh, and phone calls as well. But if you have a question or anything like that, feel free to contact me. Um, the book is available through Arcadia as well as Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Um, if you check out their local history section, the Barnes and Noble section in Newburgh has it as well. And of course, most importantly, through the library. And as a special bonus, I'm not going to say that if you buy it through Amazon, I'm not going to sign it. But if you buy it through the library, more chances are I'm going to be there. And I'll be more than happy to sign it for you. Just feel free to ask. So with that, um, any, any questions? Okay. Very sure. Thank you, Matt, very much. Uh, yeah, we have some time. If anybody has any questions for Matt? It's very thorough. Don't forget to get <laughs> show the book again. Yeah. <laughs> the library. And... There are so many more, uh, like you said, uh, photos in here in history. And Matt has wonderful explanations with his photos too. Um, we're going through that uh, the other day. Yeah, I don't want to um, steal, sorry. Go ahead. I don't want to steal your sales, Matt, but we also do have uh, a copy or two at the library for you to borrow if you want to uh, <laughs> see what all the fuss is about before you, uh, you make a decision. That's that's for the out-of-towners. We, we don't, we, we <laughs> We give that we give that to, to them but they see the thing with the thing with the books that we 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 we, we do and and you are more than welcome to check out the book to see what the fuss is about but the thing is with that you won't get a cute little drawing or a, a nice little phrase for me in that so um you right. know to teach their own <laughs> you got that.
You know, and I was thinking too, when they just sell it, a nice gift if we've had our some of our relatives or kids or grandkids move out of the area. This would be a great history for them to look back on the history of where they came from too. The holidays coming up, <laughs> so yeah. yeah. Any I, other they, questions? Okay, okay. All right. I guess not. We can always contact you, Matt. We know where you are at the Moffat Library. Again, on behalf of the friends and everybody here, thank you very, very much for your your presentation for us and all the work you do for us in the library. And I want to thank everybody who's joined us tonight. Uh, I appreciate your coming to us and via Zoom, hopefully next year we will be in person. <laughs> Let's keep our fingers crossed, but thank you so much for this evening and for all you do for the friends in the Moffat Library. So uh, have a good evening, everybody, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you very much. Thanks. Take care. Thank you. Everybody. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Mary Ann. Okay, thank you, everybody. Have a Thank good you. one. <laughs> good night. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye everybody.